<laughs> well, amen. Thank you. Psalm 71. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. All right, now. <clears throat> I'll get that way. I'm going to find another chapter and verse. This, uh, today, we're going to begin uh, the last of the series of Lessons from the Kings from 2 Chronicles. We're going to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 16. Now, the last several weeks, we have looked at seeking God. First of all, we looked at seeking God for His wisdom. We talked about the difference between being clever and smart and being wise. Then we talked about seeking God for his way. There is a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is destruction. But there is a way that the Lord would lead a man. And that's the way we want. I want to seek the Lord and find his way and go his way. And then we talked about seeking the Lord in war. We looked at Asa when he fought the battle against the Ethiopians, how he sought the Lord and said, God, they're too big. They're too many. Only you can, can win a war like this. And we saw God win a great victory in that war. And then we looked at seeking God in worship and how the nation of Judah under Asa's leadership came together and they committed themselves and said, we're going to seek God. Matter of fact, they committed themselves so much, they said that if any man or woman, great or small, does not seek God, they will be put to death. I don't know how many of you would sign up for that, but, uh, but that's how committed they were. Matter of fact, some theologians said that this, in chapter 15, was the first revival listed in Scripture of how a nation repented of their sins. They turned to the Lord, and God blessed them and put his hand upon them. We find from chapter 15, we see in chapter 15, the last verse, Asa being blessed by God, and it says that there was no more war until the 35th year of the king. And chapter 16 opens up with a battle, or preparations for a battle, rather. And something must have happened from chapter 15 to 16. I, did, I didn't look to see how much time elapsed. I didn't study that part, but my, the Bible that I read, the, it kind of subtitled this chapter, Asa's Last Years. I was sharing with the church on Wednesday night about faith, and which is a large part of what I'm going to share with you this morning on the, on the topic of trusting God, having faith in God. And what I have found, and I want you to let me say this and explain it before you get offended at me. If I say it and explain it and then you get offended, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about it later. But I have found in the ministry that the older people get the less they trust God. I'm going to let that sink in for a moment, and then I'm going to explain it. Now, granted, that's not the case in every situation. There are some who have been faithful. This morning in the first service, we celebrated with the Klepper, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Klepper, who are celebrating 65 years of marriage. That's faithfulness, folks. That's faithfulness. But I shared with the church on Wednesday night how that I've watched even in the lives of my own grandparents who were some of the godliest people I knew that as they approached uh, their latter years, they began to become more concerned about their finances and how they would be taken care of when they got old than trusting God. We're going to find this to be absolutely true with King Asa. As he got old, he feared for his life. He feared for his position. Somewhere along the way, he quit trusting God. And so as I begin this morning, I want you to ask yourself, where am I? Is your faith growing or is it declining? You see, our bodies begin to decline. They grow, they grow, and at some point they be begin to decline. But your faith never should. Your complete trust in God should never decline. So where are you this morning? We're going to learn some lessons from this, this chapter of, of King Asa's life as his life comes to a close. And tonight I'm going to finish this. We're going to look at 
We're going to contrast the battle that we're going to talk about today. We're going to contrast that with the battle he fought the first time in chapter 15, the last part of 14 in chapter 15. But where are you this morning? Is your faith growing? Is it declining? You see, the devil would have you believe, especially some who are getting older, some of you who are advancing in years, he'd have you believe that you're done. That you're no longer effective. That you've done all the work you can do. But I'm going to tell you something this morning, church. The devil's a liar. Amen? If you woke up this morning, God has a job for you to do. So take your pills, whatever you got to do, and keep right on going. Amen? God does not have any people who are still serving him that he's done with. If he was done with you, you'd, you wouldn't be here. You'd be on home. And I'm going to tell you something. Uh, a dear brother spoke to me over the weekend at, a, at one of our functions, and he said uh, he was looking for a place to come where the older men are. You don't hear that a whole lot, do you? But you know why? Because in times past, he's been where they were, and he learned from them. They impacted his life. And I'm going to tell you, church, that's how it should be. The young, the Bible says the younger are to learn from the older. The old men, older men are supposed to teach the young men. The older ladies are supposed to teach the younger ladies. You are our example. But if you have quit trusting if you've quit walking with God, if all you can talk about is what happened 20 years ago, what's God saying today? What are you trusting Him for today? Because if you're still alive, and I'm looking at all of you, you look alive, then God has a work for you. One of my heroes was Brother Manley Beasley, and I'm going to talk more about him later, but I was a young, young man when he passed away, and I was a lot younger when he was in the heyday of his ministry. But his, he was a friend of my family, but his life has impacted mine, even though I didn't know him well one-on-one. His books on faith have just radically changed my life. And oh, a couple of years ago, a gentleman wrote his biography. He passed, Brother Manley Beasley passed away in 1990, but they wrote his biography that came out a couple years ago, and again, just stirred my heart. Because this man trusted God like no one I have ever known. At one time, he had seven incurable diseases. Five of them were deadly, were fatal. More than one time, they called him, his family in and said he's not going to make it. And he, <laughs> he would rebuke the doctor and say, Doctor, God has not told me my time is up. Don't call my family and tell them I'm dead. And sure enough, God would raise him up. But he, oftentimes he would corner my dad. My dad would always get, he, his story is, he would get nervous when he'd see Brother Manley because he would say to him, Jimmy, what are you trusting God for today that if he don't come through, you won't make it? And that's a question we ought to ask ourselves. What are we trusting God for? What are we believing him for? But we're going to talk about faith today. First, 2 Chronicles chapter 16 in verse 1, in the 36th year of Asa's reign, Basha, king of Israel, went up against Judah and fortified Ramah to prevent anyone from leaving or entering the territory of Asa, king of Judah. Asa then took the silver and gold out of the treasuries of the Lord's temple and of his own palace and sent it to Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, who was ruling in Damascus. Let there be a treaty between me and you, he said, as there was between my father and your father. See, I am sending you silver and gold. Now break your treaty with Basha, king of Israel, so he will withdraw from me. Ben-Hadad agreed with King Asa and sent the commanders of his forces against the towns of Israel. They conquered Ezion, Dan, Abel, Maim, and all the store cities of Naphtali. When Basha heard this, he stopped building Ramah and abandoned his work. Then King Asa brought all the men of Judah, and they carried away from Ramah the stones and timber Basha had been using. With them, he built up Giva and Mizpah. All right, so let's, let's get the picture. Now, we've seen Asa call the people to revival. We've seen him seek God, tear down the foreign idols, get rid of the foreign worship, and call the nation to repentance and to seek the Lord their God. And we've seen in response to that, God bless them. 
and put his hand upon them and use them. But something has happened to Asa. And again, the only clue that I've been given as I have studied is that it says it, these are his last years. He's getting older. He may not have the strength that he used to have. And so when he faces a problem that he has in some ways faced before, he handles it totally different. So here's what happened. Basha, king of Israel, comes down and he goes to Ramah. Now you'd have to see, I really wanted to, to have a map up here for you to look at, but I couldn't find the one that I was looking for that would explain it well. But if you were to put the border between Israel, the north, and Judah in the south, Ramah is just south of the border. It's just right across the border into Judah. And what he did was he came down and he began to fortify that city. There was one main road that came up out of Judah and went into Israel, and it was through Ramah. And so he went down to Ramah and he fortified the city so that nobody could leave Israel. You say, well, why would he do that? Well, if you remember back in chapter 15 and verse 9, it says that the, because the, the population knew that God was with Asa, large numbers began to migrate south. And they were leaving Israel and going to Judah because the word was out. There's revival going on in Judah, and we want to go see what's going on. And remember, we talked about that in here, is that one of the greatest ways that we can see our church grow is that we let God do in us whatever he wants to do. And if no it'd be noise abroad, there's something going on at First Baptist Church. Those people are on fire down there that God is with them. I don't know what's happening, but I, I want to go find out. And they show up. And that's what happened with Asa. God was using him. He was surrendered. He was trusting. His heart was committed to the Lord. And people were coming south. And so Basha comes down and he cuts off the road getting to Judah so that no more people would leave Israel. But you see, this wasn't the Ethiopian army. You remember in chapter 14, the Ethiopian comes out. <laughs> let's try that again. My brain's working a little faster than my mouth. So if y'all just bear with me just for a moment. The Ethiopian army comes down and the Bible says they set up battle fronts. In other words, what they did is they just come down and said, all right, we're here, Asa, we're ready to fight because we're fixing to wipe y'all out. And the Bible says that Asa went down and met them in the battlefield. But Basha, king of Israel, didn't do that. No, he didn't come down to, to fight or necessarily to take over Judah or at least not to destroy them. I think probably in Basha's mind, if I were to to use the theater of my, my imagination and, and guess a little bit, I would say Basha probably would have loved to have taken over Judah and restored the kingdom and he be the king. But he didn't set up battle lines, no. He went and, and took over one of the cities. He became a threat to Asa. You see, somehow Asa is now worried about his position. He was no longer moving forward in trusting God and, and, and leaning on the Lord for every, everything that happens to him. He now is comfortable as king. He's been at peace, is what the last verse of chapter 15 says, that they were, had been at, they were at peace until the 35th year of King Basha. He's comfortable as king. He's probably very wealthy. He's got the armies. No, everybody's afraid of him. Nobody's coming after him. People are, are, are coming into Judah. They're growing. He gets comfortable. I'm going to tell you, church, it's a danger we all face. That when we start seeking God and God starts blessing us, we start getting comfortable. If I were to offer this morning a criticism for the Southern Baptist Convention, because I can, you know, it's just, it's just my opinion, is that we've been trying for years to create a formula on something that God blesses. When it all boils down to, they just simply obeyed God. They committed themselves to God. They sought the Lord, and God put his hand on them. And when we see that happening all across the United States, when we watch a church that God blesses, and they begin to grow, and they, we bottle it and start shipping it out. That's what we do. Instead of seeking God for ourselves and saying, God, what do you want to do here in this church? How do you want us to do things? We look at, oh, well, you know what? The, the, this church did that, and they grew to be uh, a million members. And so we bottle it, and we ship it out, and say, hey, the, everybody drink this, because that's what's working over here. 
Somehow, Asa has gotten comfortable. God has blessed him. He's doing well. He's probably wealthy. He likes his position. So when, when Basha, king of Israel, comes down and, and threatens him, he's literally threatening his position. He didn't come to, to destroy Judah, but Asa feels threatened. You're messing with my position. You're messing with my power. And instead of seeking God, he didn't turn to the Lord and say, Lord, this, this enemy has come now to set up some kind of stronghold in our country. What do we do? No. He finds somebody who can help him. And that's what he did in verse 2. Asa then took the silver and gold out of the treasuries of the Lord's temple and of his own palace and sent it to Ben-Hadad, king of Aram or king of Syria, who was ruler in Damascus. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. 2 Chronicles 15, verse 18 says, in their revival time, it says that Asa brought into the temple of God the silver and gold and the articles that he and his father had dedicated. Asa gave this money to God. He dedicated th this money to the Lord. But at the first sign of trouble, he withdrew from the bank. I mean, he took it and ran. Lord, this is your money. We dedicate it to you. But he didn't ask God if he could have it. He took it back. He went into the house of God. I'm just picturing this in my mind, if you will, for a moment. He went into the house of God and took what he gave to God. Didn't ask God about what he should do in his situation. He figured it himself out. This is what I'm going to do. I'll go find somebody who can fix this for me. I'll find somebody who is strong enough to defeat my enemy. And he took his money and God's money to do it. And I'll tell you, we better be careful when we commit something to God. What's God's is God's. And we better leave it alone. But he went and took what he had given to the Lord and took it back. And it says there in verse 3, he says to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, or king of Aram, let there be a treaty between me and you. Now, you know, the Bible has already taught him, the law has already taught him that the nation of Israel and Judah are not to have ties to foreign nations. They're not to make treaty agreements with foreign countries. They are to be solely committed to God. But he does. He compromises his belief. You see, he gets in trouble. He's scared. He's afraid he's going to lose everything he's got. And instead of trusting God, he takes God's money, hires a foreign country to come and help him out. But if we're not careful, we'll do the same thing. We'll get in trouble. We'll get worried about us. You see, when you focus all your time on yourself, you can't see the big picture anymore. I just want to hang on. See, the, the number one reason we quit trusting God is because God blesses us and we don't want to lose it. God's given me some things. He's blessed me with some things and I want to hoard it. I want to hang on to it. And that's what happened. God blessed Asa. He blessed him in his kingdom. Blessed him with wealth. Blessed him, blessed him with power. And what did Asa do? As he grew older, he became afraid that he'd lose it all. But you know what faith says? Ne next week, we're going to look, begin looking at the life of Job. But you know what faith says? The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job said, naked came I into this world, and naked will I depart. I didn't bring it with me, and I can't take it with me. And one of the number one obstacles to faith is we have gained something and we, that we don't want to lose. And I can assure you of this. Every time you begin to trust something other than God, he will find something bigger to take it away from you. God is a jealous God. He will not allow you to put your faith in something other than himself. You see, he hired, Asa hired Ben-Hadad. He compromised his beliefs. He compromised the law of God. And he went out and hired a foreign king 
to come and help him. And in verse 4, it says, Benadad agreed with, the king, with king Asa. Well, I'm sure he did. You get paid enough money. A wicked man paid enough money will do anything he's told to do at the right price. So he, he sent the commanders of his forces against the towns of Israel. He hired him, and he, he did what he was told. I'm going to tell you something. You can buy man's power. Man's power can be bought. God's power must be sought. Amen? You can buy man's power. God, man's power can be bought, but God's power must be sought. There's not enough money in this world to make God come down out of heaven and do for you what needs to be done. But you too, you put a child of God on his knees, surrendered to God, and saying, Lord, I can't do anything about this. Would you come and rescue me? And something stirs the heart of God when a child trusts in him and will not be turned away. Ben-Hadad agreed. And he went and did what Asa asked him to do. And it worked. You say, well, how did it work? Why did it work? Why did God allow this plan to work? Well, sometimes God gives you what you ask for. And this is exactly what happened. In verse 5, it says, When Basha heard this, he stopped building Ramah and abandoned his work. Then King Asa brought all the men of Judah, and they carried away from Ramah the stones and timber Basha had been using. And then he built up Geba and Mizpah. He did exactly to Basha, king of Israel, what Basha had done to him. He went to his own border towns and ramped them up so, so Basha couldn't get through there. It worked. The plan worked. But you see, he was being clever. He's being wise, not wise. He was being clever and smart. He politically found a good way. He found somebody who was stronger than his enemy. You know, you know remember the old saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend? Y'all never heard that? Up and down means yes. I can forth. But it's true. I have watched people come together who did not like each other to defeat a common enemy. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. That's exactly his philosophy, what Ace's philosophy was. I will find somebody who is bigger than my enemy and I will use him to defeat my enemy. All the plan worked. And God sometimes will let you have what you're wanting. I've, I've, I'm about to learn. I've been saved since I was 15. And I'm just about to grab a hold. There, there are times, well, I may just back this up. I'm still in the process of learning that when I am determined to have something, that I'm having to force things, I'm having to, to make something happen, I have found that every time I do that, I get so far out of the will of God instead of allowing God to do what God wants to do. And when I back up and say, you know what, God, I can't do that. I'm sorry. He answers every time. Asa did not seek God. He did not look for God's wisdom. He didn't wait for God's plan. He just took God's money and ran. And went and hired an enemy, his own enemy. Syria was not his friend. He went and hired his own enemy to defeat the current enemy. And it worked until the prophet showed up. This is twice this has happened to Asa. He, he went out to battle in chapter 14. When he came back in chapter 15, the, the prophet encouraged him, keep doing what you're doing. God is with you. When you're with him, when you're seeking him, when you're following after him, he's blessing you. But if you quit seeking him, if you quit walking after him, he will quit blessing you. And it encouraged him. He went and did more. But in this chapter, the prophet did not have good news for Aram, I mean for Asa. It says in verse 7 that at that time, Hananiah the seer came to Asa king of Judah and said to him, because you relied on the king and not on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Aram has escaped you. He said you relied, you had faith in, you trusted the king of Syria. You didn't trust God. You trusted the king of Syria. You went out and found somebody you thought was capable of handling 
your problem. And it wasn't God. You didn't look for God. I was telling you about Brother Manley Beasley. He was an evangelist. He taught on faith. He wrote faith workbooks. Just stirred my heart to trust God. And a man came to him one day during one of his revivals and said, Brother Manley, I want to financially back your ministry. And Brother Manley thought he was talking about just supporting him. He said, well, I appreciate that. He said, no, no, I don't think you understand. I, I want to fund your ministry. You send me your bills, I'll pay them. But you know, most of us would go, look at what God has done. Wow. But that wasn't Brother Manley's response. His response to him was, well, how much can you financially afford to cover my bills? He's like, oh, Brother Manley, I, I probably have $2 million I can, can put behind your ministry. And this was back in the late 70s, early 80s. And Brother Manley said, well, sir, what if my need is, say, $3 million? Are you going to go borrow the money? Uh, are you, are you going to send it back to me? What do you, he said, the man began to stutter and stammer like, uh, well, you know, what are you going to do when what I need is more than what you have? That's what, that's what the question boils down to. What are you going to do when what I need is more than what you have? He said, you see, I can't trust you. I, while I appreciate your gift, I have to keep my trust in Almighty God because he's paid every bill to date. And $4 million is nothing to God. It may be a problem to you, but it is nothing to God. You see, any time we start putting our trust in something other than God, God will send us something bigger than what we're trusting. Hananiah came to Asa and said, you relied on the king. You trusted in the king instead of trusting in God. And I want you to look at this. He says there, because you did this, the army of the king of Aram, or Syria, has escaped your hand. He said, no, wait a minute. He was fighting the king of Israel. But it says there, because you relied on this king, his army has escaped your hand. And as I study this scripture, what I come to find is what could have been maybe possible, speculation because it didn't happen. But the possibility is, if he had sought God, God may would have given him Israel and Syria. Because God was blessing Asa. Asa was seeking him and trusting him. God may have given him the entire kingdom back and restored the kingdom back to himself. And Asa would have been king. Who knows? He said, the king of Syria has escaped your hand. He could have given him that whole area if he trusted him. But because he didn't, he said, they've all escaped from your hand. You didn't rely on God. You didn't trust me. You didn't trust the Lord. And matter of fact, he goes on to say, were not the Cushites and the Libyans a mighty army with great numbers of chariots and horsemen? Didn't you face a big army already? Haven't you already been through this one time? Why don't we remember church? Why do we, you and I, struggle remembering what God has done for us in the past? You see, the past is a wonderful thing if you'll take hold of it, if you'll remember it. Now, we don't want to remember the mistakes, but I'm going to tell you what I do want to remember this morning. I want to remember that when I called out to God, He answered me. When I needed something, He provided for me. When I cried out to Him, He heard me. History reminds me that God is faithful. David said, I was young, and now I'm old. I have never seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen his seed begging bread. Everything I've ever need, God has provided it. And he said to Asa, why, won't, why didn't you remember when you faced the king of Israel? You've already faced a big army, and God won a victory for you. But you didn't ask him this time. You didn't trust him this time. You wanted to hang on to the kingdom for yourself. You was afraid you might lose control. Oh, church, I'm going to tell you something. I want to lose control this morning. I want the Holy Spirit of God to have all of me because he's the only one that can provide what I need. He's the only one that can take care of me. 
Asa didn't want to let go of what he had. But look at this, verse 9. When you relied, the last part of verse 8, when you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. God is searching. He is looking for that person whose heart is committed to him to help them, to strengthen them. As I mentioned earlier, Dwight L. Moody said, the world has yet to see what God could do with a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, whose heart is sold out to God, fully and completely committed to him. Can you imagine? God is seeking for that person. He's looking. His eyes are roaming throughout the earth looking for that one whose heart is committed to him. And then look at what he says. Asa you have done a foolish thing, and from now on, you will be at war. You've done a foolish thing. You know, I have often operated in my immaturity and stupidity. I have operated on the basis of it's easier to get forgiveness than permission. The problem is there is a price to pay for disobedience. Does God forgive you? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Can I walk with him again? Absolutely. Can I fellowship with God again? Yes, you sure can. But there's a price to pay. There's a price to pay. I read this morning, I forget where, it says a certain man was backslid on the Lord. And in God's judgment of trying to draw him back, he lost his leg. And the question was, well, can God forgive this man? And he said, absolutely, God will forgive him. But he'll hop the rest of his life on one leg. Will God forgive us for disobedience? He sure, certainly will. Will he allow us to repent when we've gone astray? Praise the Lord, he does. But there's a cost. There is a price. Asa was at war the rest of his life. I want to tell you something, folks. Walking by faith is tough. There are days that it's difficult to wait on God. But I am reaching, <laughs> I'll say it that way, I am reaching a point in my life I would rather look like a fool to the world and trust God than never have any faith at all. I'd rather step out on a limb and be wrong than to never trust him. Is your faith increasing or is it declining? Can you look back on your life this morning and see the last time you trusted God and he came through? Or are all your stories 10, 15, 20 years in the past because you've quit trusting him. I shared with the church Wednesday night the story of my grandparents that when I was a baby, four, four months old, in a car wreck, hit the windshield, cracked my skull from my ear to the front, and almost died seven days, cried day and night, and I watched, or I didn't watch, but I was told of my grandmother and her prayer partner who prayed for me night and day. My grandmother would sit by my side night and day begging God to spare my life and to heal me because surgery on a four-month-old in 1972, the chances of success were low. As I was growing up, I knew of my grandparents to be a man and a woman who believed God. But when they died, what I remember are two people who walked away from God for a while. Oh, they, they still loved God, but they didn't trust him like they used to. The fire wasn't hot like it used to be. They talked of fear. They talked of failure. They talked of finances, but they didn't talk of faith. And when they mentioned God, it was 
10 years ago, 15 years ago, when God had done something for them. But I'm going to tell you, if you woke up this morning, God has determined for your faith to be alive and well. You can trust him today. The just will live by faith. It was by grace through faith that I was saved, and it is by grace through faith that I live. God has not determined. That's what Paul said. He said to the Galatians, O foolish to Galatians, having started in the Spirit, are you now depending on the flesh? The flesh will fail you. I'm going to tell you something, church. I want to leave this world, and my kids look back at my life and say, he trusted God till every ounce of breath left his body. He believed. Where are you this morning? Are you in chapter 14 of Asa's life when he was trusting God for every step? Are you in chapter 16 where his faith has declined and he's looking for other means to take care of him? Let's stand together, every head bowed and every eye closed. Only you can answer those questions. Only you know your heart as God is speaking to you. Whatever God is saying to you this morning, I pray you be obedient. These altars are going to be open. Maybe you just want to come and pray, spend some time with the Lord. Maybe God has said something specific and you want to come to these altars and get it right with Him or just pray. You may be here this morning and you're lost. You don't know of the Savior which I've spoke today. I just want to simply tell you this morning that Jesus Christ loved you enough to leave his home in glory, to come to this earth and live a pure, sinless, spotless life, to die on a rugged tree and shed his blood for you so that you could be saved. They buried him in a tomb. But last week we remembered that on the third day he rose, defeating death, hell, and the grave. And today he wants to save you. Won't you come and surrender your life to him? Won't you come give yourself to him? Our men are going to be here, Brother Morgan and Brother Nathan and myself. We're here if you need to speak with us. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. And Lord, I pray you speak to our hearts. Let, may the Holy Spirit of God do in us what needs to be done this morning. May we be obedient to what you've spoken to our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As they begin to sing, you come. Whatever God has spoke to your heart this morning, you come.